Okay, I'm here with somebody that I know and love, but I know that our listeners may not. So Pam Benson Owens, why don't you start by telling us what you do and a little bit about your background? So my name is Pam Benson Owens. I am a longtime entrepreneur and consultant here in the Austin area. Uh, I currently dual CEO between Edge of Your Seat Consulting, my organization, and Six Square, which is the Austin Black Cultural Arts District. But at any given time, by way of the work that I do, I can be in an organization serving in a variety of roles to help them with organizational culture or stabilizing their finances or addressing um, their leadership. So it just kind of depends on what I am asked to do, but the crux of it is to come into organizations and help with complex issues and helping them be the best that they can be. So you're just wearing like a few hats at a time, not that many, right? <laughs> I, I, as I've gotten older, I don't wear as many hats, but I definitely on any given day can be wearing a variety of hats, which is what right. I love. Right. So what, what inspired you to begin this work, to start consulting directly with different organizations and taking on this kind of uh, coaching with them? Well, I started in a corporate job uh, right out of school. First, I taught high school, and then I went into a corporate job. And at that time, um, I was quite young, and the president of the organization said, hey, listen, there's really no way at 23 um, and you know that you'll be a vice president or be on our senior team, but you have a way with bringing organizations and people and organizations together, and you have a, a knack for um, kind of giving hard messages, but also preserving um, people's dignity and also talking very up the middle on organizational culture. If you were to go out on your own, um, I really think you would do well. And I said, well, I've always wanted to start a business, but I'm afraid, you know, I don't know how that will work. And he kind of pushed me out of the nest and said, I encourage you to do it. So I kind of got there by way of a really good mentor telling me it was time. And then I never looked back. Yeah, I think that's true for many of us. Those relationships that we look back on and didn't know at the time were so impactful become a big catalyst for where we land, right? And, Absolutely. And, and it's powerful what that hindsight gives us. Um, yep. So so you've been helping the Austin Board of Realtors and Actors MLS with organizational culture, with really like being sure that the talk that we talk matches the walk that we walk. What do you feel, why is it so important for an organization of any type, be it a brokerage or a tech vendor or, um, or even agents as they think about their brand and the team that they work with to manage a culture that carefully and be that acute about it? Well, first, let me say that um, it's been a blast to be uh, a consultant for Avor because there's a whole lot right about it. And so I think what's been fun is um, the opportunity to just be more intentional about a lot of the things that you're already doing. But for organizations, agents, um, you know, broker, whatever, whatever organi uh, you know, organization or construct you find yourself in, Culture is a thing and we don't talk a lot about it. Culture is this idea of like a set of beliefs, a set of core values, a set of behaviors. And when you don't pay attention to that, it's easy for it to run amok and become really expensive. So when you start talking about organizational culture um, and not paying attention to it, you miss an opportunity to A, really get to know the people, B, build connection, uh, three, you know, C, really um, understand how things work and why. Um, it's just a miss, um, and it's a lot more time and energy to fix a culture than to pay attention to a culture on the front end and giving it space to really become what it needs to be. So culture is big and expansive. People don't pay attention to it, but it's real, and it really kind of governs how we live and breathe and do life. Yeah, I think that's important, too, because what you're really saying is, Look, you've got a culture, no matter which way you dice it, whether you take care of it and you're being really deliberate about that or you let it be and it is what it is, it's there either way. And right. so what, 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 what are the ways that you uh, encourage businesses to assess what that culture is? How do you define it? If you're, if you're like, okay, look, I haven't really been a part of this. I haven't really been paying attention to it. Where do you start in that work? Well, I think when you're starting to even think about culture and you even use that word, I think each organization, the important piece is that you have to define what your culture is. And so when people, when I talk to people, like they're like, we have an employee handbook. I'm like, oh no, 
there's an employee handbook, but then there's a way how the organization lives and breathes. And so when you think about culture, you have a culture of decision making. You have a culture of communication. You have a culture of teamwork, right? You have a culture of um, atmosphere. You have a culture of fun. You have a culture of professionalism. Like start thinking about if we had to put some words to that or name that, what would it be? And when you start having those conversations, you find out really what the culture is, right? And likewise, if you don't name it or you don't have a culture that's healthy, you can find that out by way of sometimes outdated processes and procedures. Retention and how people stay and leave and breathe in the organization. How many layers of management do you have? Is it really hard to get things done? Those things are telling as well. So I always say to people, if you want to figure out what your culture is, start thinking about putting words to how it shows up every day, like how it, yeah. it you know, how it comes to be. And so I think yeah. that's the work we've been doing at Abor, and it's been powerful to yeah, watch it, that. Yeah, it has. And it's interesting because there are things that maybe you think about your business or you think about the team that you work with that are not exactly so when you start to ask those questions and dig into Absolutely. it a little bit with the team that you work with. Like, and I think, you know, for instance, one of the powerful things that we've talked a lot about with Abor is that I, I have felt in the staff to some degree has always felt that there was like a familial or a family like atmosphere. And you've done a good job of pushing back to say family doesn't mean the same thing to everybody. And your words around what your culture are really matter. Give me give me a little taste of like wh why you push back on that and, and what, what it means. Well, I push back on that because one of the things that becomes really important in culture is we decide like the rules of engagement around boundaries, right? So it is a professional setting. We are here to do a job. And while we want people to be able to be themselves and we want people to enjoy it, it is work, right? Mm -hmm. And so there's a delicate line between some boundaries and the fact that when you start using words like family, there, you know, families have their own culture and their own systems. And we all don't come to those spaces by way of having a good experience. Some of us have had dysfunctional family systems. So if you use the word family in the workplace, my mind might go to dysfunctional and I might tell a story about it in a way that's not helpful to getting work done, to working with people and being productive. And so that's why I push back on it because I want people to say, if you're gonna use the word family, it's it's a slippery slope. And families don't, you know, maybe fire people. Families don't reprimand people. Families I mean, we sometimes don't... want to fire our family. I know, but... <laughs> right, right, right. Yeah. Families yeah. don't necessarily have deadlines. So it's an incongruent kind of analogy for a workplace. And so I always tell people to be cautious. Do you want to have connection? Yes. Do you want to have good relationships? Yes. Do you want to have fun? Please name it. But family takes on a different construct that a workplace cannot always hold. And if you're in a leadership position and you do have to reprimand somebody and you haven't held the line on family, somebody's going to say back, well, I thought we were a family. When you have to reprimand somebody, it becomes additional layers of things to manage that you probably don't want. Yeah, I think too, a little bit, you're speaking to the idea of inclusion and that being um, something that requires you to bring the context of people's different experiences forward. So, you know, my version of family and your version of family and 10 other people's version of family, to your point, are very, very different. Some of those are good versions of it and some of those are, are poor and, 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 and bad experiences. And if our desire is to create a culture that can be shared cohesively across the organization, we have to do that in a, in a way with words that are inclusive, that don't necessarily bring some of that, that baggage and those experiences forward in that way. I have absolutely nothing to add to that. That was beautiful <laughs> and spot well, I've been on. well taught, but <laughs> it's beautiful and spot on. And it speaks to the fact that what's happening, I think in what you just described is like, when you get ready to operationalize inclusion and culture, right? It, requ it requires you to call the question, Hey, how are we talking about that? And that's the best way to remain uh, relational and not transactional in the work around diversity and equity and inclusion. Let's face it, that's come up a lot. People smush those words together. Those are very different things. And so when you get ready to actually practice it, it becomes a real critical component 
uh, or practice and boundary and naming things. Like, what are we talking about here? So when an organization says, we've got to do some work around diversity, how are you going to define it for your organization? Not the one down the street, your organization. Yeah, I think that's really critical. I mean, obviously the work of, of DEI, of diversity, equity, and inclusion has become more top of mind for companies of every size, shape, and form. That is certainly the case in real estate as the National Association of Realtors has adopted changes to the code of ethics. And we look at fair housing violations and the things that happen you know, within our industry, the importance of the role that my, my membership plays. But I think it's really critical to define that there is a big difference in those things. There's a difference mm -hmm. in you know, creating an equitable access to housing versus right. creating an inclusive community in the, within the association. How do you define the difference in those three terms? I think when you, that's such a great question. I think when you start talking about diversity, and of course that people like that, that word is used a lot. When I talk about diversity, I say, we are just acknowledging the presence of difference, right? Mm. And that's not just race, right? That's right. All, that, that is learning, dif that's differences in learning. That is the, the difference in how we come to the space, introverted, extroverted. That is orientation. That is class. Uh, that is exposure. That is mm. education. That is gender. I mean, it is religious, like it's huge. And so it's just mm. an acknowledgement of difference, right? So there's that piece. And then when you start talking about equity, right? That's huge. It's about how do our systems and processes and procedures ensure that everybody has a chance and opportunity. So that's recruitment. That's to your point about access to housing. Um, that's about addressing systems that might not have, that have been exclusionary. How do we then lift those out of those spaces? And that's the, the you know that's that definition. And then when you start talking about inclusion, it's about what is our threshold around how we let allow and uh, manage people in terms of how they come to the space. What are our strategies around how we hold difference? What is the threshold around inclusion for our organization, right? And I think that's the part that makes people the most uncomfortable. It's like when we define inclusion, what are we talking about here? And what can our professional environment and threshold be able to, um, give space to breathe and do, right? So when I say inclusion, like, what does that mean for us here? And nobody wants to talk about that because it's like, wait, there's parameters around inclusion? Yes. Inclusion is not a free spirited practice. It's it not. takes work, right? It, it takes, takes work. Intentional work. And it also says to organizations, you have to be able to name what you're not going to be in order to get to inclusion. Yeah, I mean, my sense is that, you know, you ask any given company or any given professional today, are, are you doing DEI work and do you care about it? Absolutely. friggin' -lutely. Yes, I'm on that. I'm doing all three of them. Uh, when, I, when you push on what does that mean in the context of the things that you do, the way that you operate your business, the people that you serve, I think it gets a lot harder. And I I can give grace for that because I understand why the work is difficult, but I maybe you start at the point of just asking yourself, what are the differences in these terms as it relates to my business? What are the things I can do and can't do? And, and how can I start just a bite at a time, you know, nibbling at some of these ideas? Absolutely. I think the number one reason that organizations become performative and have such a fear of doing it wrong, which, mm what's wrong, right, right, um, is the conditioning around we have to perform and have a checklist and it's an either or. Mm. But really, the work of inclusion is a both and. And it's the I, idea of anchoring culture in the space, which is what y'all, the work that y'all are doing. Yeah, and it's interesting too because it's interesting that something that should be so um, feel good and such about community and belonging feels so high risk too. Mm -hmm. And it, it, and it yep. does right now. I, I think that's the nature of the world that we're in to some degree. I think it's also the confusion that's been created around the difference in these terms and the, and the intention behind them. But, um, you know, I guess my encouragement to 
real estate professionals and, and tech providers and folks working in my business across the country is that if you just sort of take the bite that you can take, be engaged to the extent that you feel comfortable and confident in it, then, then the work matters, even right. if it's not, you know, what you think is enough. Right. But part of the thing that we don't talk about too is, um, by way of social construct, by way of society, there are some societal norms that we've been conditioned to that perpetuate itself in the workplace. The first is the either or environment that I've talked about. Mm. The either or environment is specifically kind of positioned and steeped in our societal norms. The other part is that we don't really honor progress. It's either all or nothing. You either gotta, you gotta do the 12 steps, you know, you gotta do the task list or it's nothing. So we don't really honor progress by societal norm. And then if we're really honest about how we've been conditioned, many of us were told in our youth that there are some things you never talk about, right? You never talk about politics, you never talk about race, you never talk about religion right? Well, how has that served us well? So then when we come into the workspace, we absolutely then think we have zero common sense and are afraid to even engage brave and courageous conversations about things we've been conditioned not to talk about. And so it's a myth. So how can we go back to that in a way and start practicing by way of culture connection and getting to know each other at the base level in a way that allows us to then on-ramp some of these conversations that we've been conditioned not to have. So for y'all, from the culture building perspective, when we got ready to lift it, we started talking about competencies and what are those behaviors we want. But we also have lifted some internal gatherings that have nothing to do with work. We're <laughs> simply gonna gather and connect. What a yeah. novel idea. So yeah. that we know each other. So that we know each right. other. Right. It's interesting too that you're saying, you know, we've been conditioned not to have these conversations, but the whole, the definition that you provided of diversity was just to acknowledge those differences. And you right. can't acknowledge them if you're unwilling to have the conversation and talk about it and just, you know, be aware of the fact that we are different and that that's right. a great thing, you know? But if, but if we just spent a year practicing that, that would be progress, right? It's like yeah. the conditioning of right or wrong. I come to a space and I'm right and you are wrong. Instead of I'm coming to the space and I'm curious about what mm. you think about it, it is different from what I think, but it doesn't make you wrong and it doesn't make me right or wrong. Yeah. It just and is. from a and from a leadership perspective, the, the truth of it is having that kind of conversation with nuance and gray area and and you know wanting to understand and yearning from a from a place of seeking to understand first, it's far more difficult than black or white, right or wrong. Oh, black uh, and, and white's I, way more comfortable. <laughs> yeah, and then so I, you know, you have to push yourself as, as as people leading the way in your industry or in your own businesses to find opportunity to look for the gray because there's benefit there. And it, it while it's challenging, I think it can be really beneficial to um, your ultimate successes. Absolutely, and if you're going to start the practice of of the nuance and the gray, you have to also be ready to hold that you know, you might get something wrong or you might say something to somebody that's that that's offensive or whatever. But the bottom line is I always say to people like, if you don't at least step out there and practice it, you're never gonna know, right? Right. right. So there's an opportunity to just get curious, lean into curiosity about things, lean into wanting to know more about somebody that becomes part, you know, if you're in the field doing it, like ask some questions and then be quiet mm, and let it yeah. just be. Like don't, yeah. don't, don't feel like you have to defend it or convince somebody, just let it sit. Mm. And realtors are interesting because they, they are in that position every day of, you know, asking those questions, seeking to understand what somebody really wants. You know, I can tell you, I want what I want in a house, but that's a lot different than understanding the intention behind what I need and my family construct and, you know, who I'm trying to serve in this purchase that is terrifying and large and expensive and, um, I, I think they're, I, I think our mission as a community of real estate professionals is really profound in this conversation because they have the skill set to do this well if they use it in this way. Right. Um, and so, I, you know, I charge my people to do that and do it well. But, but my thing is the beautiful part about this industry is there is a transferable skill. And I think yeah. what stops people is because it's, it's, it's a subject matter that you might not be conditioned to 
you mm. you don't trust yourself in it, right? But yeah. really, you already have the transferable skill built in, right? The ability yeah. to, to ask questions, to get curious, and receive information, right? You're not moving into that house. They are. So it comes yeah. built in. Like, you're not, right? Like, yeah. you can also leverage and lift what you already have in your toolkit very powerfully to then start creating these spaces around diversity and inclusion in ways that I will say some other industries don't have that built yeah. in. Yeah. It's, it's yep. about being able to expand it. It's about being, you know, expand what you already have in your toolkit, trust what you have in your toolkit, right? And use it. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. I, I, I think, I think realtors are well equipped in competencies that they're un, unfamiliar with using in this way. And I look forward to seeing them leverage those skills in a way that moves forward conversations like this and moves forward more diverse communities and just, you know, the recognition of, of who they serve and the vast differences between those clients and the people that make up Central Texas for sure. Absolutely. Absolutely. I love that. Okay. So, so, so you use a term in your work with us that I love and that has become very meaningful to our organization and it's the term over indexing. We have all come to realize in our work with Pam Benson Owens that when we think we're, you know, really rock solid and everything's going well, we are pro we, we are potentially overdoing it on one side because we're compensating for the other. Talk a little bit about how you see that that come forward in, in different scenarios in your work. Absolutely. I love that y'all have embraced it because the first couple of times I use it, they're like, what? I don't but but I well, really, it felt offensive when you were calling us out, but now now we're ready to embrace it. <laughs> it was more of a call in because I care. Uh, uh -huh. But but the, <laughs> the concept of over indexing is, as somebody that's a professional at it, right, and has had to really graduate from like that piece, is that you overcompensate for things and you remove this notion of progress, um, and you remove the notion of things that are already going really well. And a lot of that comes from kind of overachiever syndrome. So it's like, how do you then strike the balance? Because I, I definitely wanna be in space with people that are achieving, but sometimes in that space, you have to define what is enough and be okay with that. So over-indexing is when you, you, you feel like you have to, like it's already great and you feel like you have to, to make it into the stratospheric level for it to be really great. When in, in reality, it's already great. And so sometimes you, overdo it right so when we say like we're going to do some culture work and by the end of the you know by in, the end of the month we're going to have this done it's like when organizations come in and ask me to be like we need to be anti-racist by tuesday and i'm like back mm -hmm. up over indexing what's your culture yeah. who are yeah. you what's your identity let's anchor those things first so i use that term a lot and and, and i use it lightheartedly because i want people to also honor the fact that you know, especially now when we're in a pandemic and things have been really interesting and people have this decision fatigue and you're not sure which way is up. Think about it. We've had a pandemic. We've had social unrest. We've had an interesting economic landscape, right? And economic, you know, even the housing industry, that yeah. has been, that's a whole case study. Crazy, crazy, crazy. town. So <laughs> any, one yeah. of the, any one of those independently is a lot. You put those together and it is a classic recipe for feeling like you have to stick the landing on all of it and you yeah. don't. And so that is the anatomy of over-indexing, feeling like you have to hit, stick the landing on all of it and, and, and acting like that's not happening. It's my biggest beat with leaders right now. Leaders in this space are absolutely mired down in what should be mm. and not firmly planted in what is. Mm. Right. So we don't acknowledge it. It's like, that's not happening. Oh, it is happening. And so what can you reasonably do well in what is happening? And can't that be enough? So that's how I'm I always holding too, the line. It, the, you know, the thing about over indexing too, that I've been thinking about in our organization and for the, the, the people that I work with is I, I work with an incredibly professional, very successful team. And it, that overachiever syndrome was absolutely running rampant at the Office of Realtors, which is amazing. That's why we've been as successful as we've been. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, but I think about what is our intention in the things that we're so fixated on? Is our intention just to like notch the belt and have the success because that feels good and it's gratifying in the moment? Or is the intention, you know, to manage what is manageable because everything else is so chaotic and Sometimes just taking that gut check, I feel, around why we do what we do um, can be a powerful leadership moment as well. 
I love it. And the fact that you now, I, I have to say you and the team in just a very short amount of time, because you're so talented. Now, when I say, when now that we've talked about over-indexing, y'all are now self-checking. You're over-indexing. Yeah. You're now saying, oh, I think I'm over-indexing. I'm like, yep, my, my work is, I don't, don't need to touch yeah. that anymore. So that's I mean, so it's a joke now. <laughs> yeah, but that's yeah. what's so powerful about acknowledging it. And, and to your point, when you have a highly successful team, when you have a high functioning, performing team, it's going to happen. And so the opportunity becomes like, not only why are we doing what we're doing, what happens if we don't do that, right? Mm. Sometimes we assume constraints and we assume casualties in a way that, that isn't real. It's a story we tell ourselves and it doesn't even ever come to pass. So you then become a team that is always waiting, waiting for the other shoe to drop. And that is not a good culture. Yeah. Yeah. I think too, when I think about um, realtors in the market, the pace that they've been in, the way that they've been having to work, I see over indexing in just wanting to control what is controllable because there's a lot of chaos. I mean, it's right. a very overwhelming market. The pace is insane. The prices are rising. You're fatigued with buyers that feel that they're never going to get what they need to get. Um, and I, I see them just like over fixating then on the thing that they can hold, hold dear. Right. And right. I yep. understand that because it takes one to know one, but I think too that we have to work hard not to like swing too far to that side just because it's an uncomfortable position that we're in. I definitely think there's some uniqueness by way of industry too to what you're what you're naming. And so I have, you know, some dear colleagues and friends that are realtors. And I think it's interesting to me how I listen to them in the space. And it's like up at 4 a.m. I have yeah. six miles. I have, you know, you know, addressed six listings. I have meetings, 14 meetings today. I have 14, me you know, and then I, and I go, and to what end? Like I, right. that's great. But, but what would it look like if it look, if you shuffle the deck on that? And is that necessary? And then I then get to ego because are you, are you really beholden to outcome or ego at that point? And yeah, what are you trying to prove? at the end mm. of the day. And so I then also with your, with the team, y'all team, I'm always pushing back on like, what is the end game and why? More, the end game is always more. <laughs> end game, to what Which end? Which is not acceptable. Right, right. right. No, to I what mean, end and at what fair. cost? To what yeah. end and at what cost, right? Yeah, that's fair, that's fair. right. And I also, yeah. think, I also think the world that we're in right now with the pandemic has otherwise high functioning performers thinking they're lazy. Mm. And I think we confuse laziness with coping skills. Mm. Y'all are coping beautifully, yeah. but it's like, I'm not doing enough. You're doing plenty. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's hard. I mean, as a society too, we have to reframe that and, and redesign it. We talk about the burnout now. We didn't talk about it before. So at least maybe we're, we're naming it, but what, what is actionable to create, um, not balance and not having it all because that's uh bullshit frankly and won't happen anyway but but how do we uh as you say better integrate when i need to be in my personal shelf versus when i need to be in my professional shelf and that accepting that both of those are okay oh well you already know i graduated from balance uh about eight years ago um <laughs> yeah. i think balance is a unfortunate social you know societal norm too that actually creates performance issues, right? It's like, it's, mm. it, it actually becomes something you have to perform in, right? And so mm. to me, balance is this opportunity to perform. But if you were to adopt work-life integration, it's an opportunity to preside over your life. Two different approaches, right? And so I think I've talked to the team at, at, at length about this around how when I made this shift in that, I got honest about the fact that my life does not come in fourths. Like I'm gonna do a fourth <laughs> of my work and a fourth of my health right. and a fourth of my momming, parenting, yeah. and a fourth of being a, a, a partner and a fourth of being a daughter. Like that was crap. And when I graduated from that and did integration, it became being honest about how my life shows up. And so I always say to people, if my kids were on this, podcast right now they would say every day the conversation is hey mom how's it looking today i'm on a 60 40. i'm going to be momming about 40 percent and 60 i got to be a professional or i'm on an 80 10. Mm. and so yeah. they will run off and make their own sandwiches and get, like they get it 
and they like it better because I'm straight with them on what really it looks like versus trying to hit some kind of balance mold. So, so what, one of the things I think about work-life balance that's interesting, especially for working mothers, is that it's like a badge of honor. You know, to your point, to be a quarter here, a quarter here, a quarter there, I've got it all, everything's fine, all the balls are in the air all the time, uh, when in fact, none of that is true. And, <laughs> and so I think you talking to us about integration and, and the concept that you're going to lean one way sometimes and lean another way the other times has been a relief that I think lots of especially working women and mothers need because it's not possible to do the alternative. And it's absurd that we think that that's something that should be honored. Absolutely. And what we tie to that, too, that's even worse is the guilt about whichever way we have to lean. Right. Right. And so I'm really committed to this, especially for working women and working moms is because when you come to the space with that guilt around it, your children feel that they then yeah. start to resent the very things that you love. So if you love the work you do. Right. But it's always this guilty piece. They will resent the work you do. Right. Yeah. If they don't see you having some self care moments, mm -hmm. right, that becomes an issue. So I have really practiced it. And I will just be honest, I have practiced it to the detriment of some situations around losing some friends behind it. Right. Mm -hmm. When I say, hey, I'm busy, what are you doing? Doing nothing. I am busy doing nothing <laughs> on purpose. Right. You should practice it. You should practice on it. Right. Purpose. I'm Try not, I don't, uh -huh. I don't want us as women, working women, to even perpetuate that yeah. ride or die got to always be going it's not good and it's not realistic and i certainly don't want to perpetuate that for working women around me for sure yeah 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 i appreciate that well in the spirit of uh proper integration i've been told by my team that you had a couple of questions that you were going to ask me and i rarely allow that to happen on my <laughs> podcast but i figure if anybody could do it it would be pam benson owen <laughs> I feel honored and I would have pushed forward anyway and tried it even yeah. if you shut me down. So I'm so glad. Yeah. So uh -huh. one of the things that I, uh, I will say that I am going to take a, a point of privilege to, to, to mention, although I know you probably won't like it and might call me later is, and I've said it before, so it's not a surprise that I think in so many amazing and significant ways, you are a very talented leader and it has been fun to watch. And just as I have come to the space as a consultant, I have learned a lot from you um, in that space. And so that's why I was like, I want to ask some questions. So my, my <laughs> first question for you is talk about in the last year, what has been the, the most challenging or the most difficult for you as far as leading the organization? Yeah, I mean, I think it's just um, it's not the pandemic itself. It's all the backlash that rolls off your back as a result of that environment. So it, when I think about it, it's the decision fatigue that everybody has, the constant um, yo-yoing, we're forward, we're back, we're good, we're not. Um, and, and all of that is happening around a very serious issue that like directly impacts our health and well-being, which is feels like an attack constantly. Um, and so I, I think the hardest thing has been to be human in that, to acknowledge what's been hard about it with our team and and be okay as people, and then also make strategic and go forward business decisions that make sense. Um, just today, I had a conversation w with a few of our team members and said, look, here's the reality. I can't put guardrails around this anymore. It it's going to keep ebbing and flowing. It's going to keep changing, and we're going to have to be comfortable with that. And I think having those conversations are di is difficult, but I think it's also having those conversations is, has been necessary and has pushed us out outside of the bounds of our comfort. I love that. Absolutely. So one of the things that I think comes up a lot as I have worked with women leaders specifically is even if you've ascended to really high levels of leadership, executive leadership, C-suite leadership, however you want to define it, that there can be this undercurrent of a crisis of confidence or a moment where you're not sure. So I don't, mm -hmm. I don't want to focus on that today. But I do want to focus on when it comes to your leadership, Emily, talk about what you know for sure when it comes to you and your leadership. Mm. Uh, I know for sure that I will always communicate clearly and effectively that, that the thing that I can do best is to be honest and transparent and direct. Now, whether that is received warmly or sometimes received as, you know, 
harsh or um, too direct is, you know, eye of the beholder. But um, but I know that what has been most critical to our success as a team has been that we communicate rapidly, that we do it often, that collaboration requires you to be honest and forward about what is happening and that you don't leave it on the table. And so I think that is something that I have brought to this team and to the culture of the organization that I run. I love that. Well, for the time that I've been here in the last year, I have come to realize that flexibility is not only a core competency, I have watched you lean into it in ways that has to be, um, you know, something that has been really interesting for you to navigate. And so I want to really know if you had to look into a crystal ball in the next five years and think about ABOR, what does ABOR in the next five years look, sound, and feel like by way of your best guess? I mean, this is funny, but the first word that comes to mind is sexy. Like there's just something really hot about Austin that people are attracted to that I love. You know, I mean, I think it is an, inc it is an incredible market that we represent. This is a, a remarkable city at a time that is just on fire from an economic standpoint. And I think that the association deserves to be that bright white light that's shining on this market and this community. Um, and so I think we're punchy and powerful and continue to push the, that envelope when it comes to what the expectation of an association or an MLS is. Um, I, I think we're also stable and strong and a community of professionals that are going to continue to serve their, their clients well. I love that. So here's my last question. Okay. So, <laughs> you know, there is a um, opportunity. I come to you and I say, hey, I want you to think about your absolute dream home cost mm. is not a factor your dream home tell me what would be the three non-negotiables in your dream home okay my dream home and i'm going to assume that like commute doesn't matter but i would live on land if i had my druthers mm -hmm. like where there are no neighbors for a, for a minute uh <laughs> and a big old and a big old porch Maybe that's the Yellowstone uh, influence on me these days. Um, I would, I will always have a swimming pool. It's too hot in Texas to not have some water to hop into. Um, and I, I love a communal kitchen. I like a place where people gather and I like to piddle and the music play and people be in my home and feel a sense of community around that, that anchor that is the kitchen. So those are the things it. for okay. me. That's great. I'm not done. One more. Sorry. Can I do one okay. more? <laughs> oh course. my gosh. Now, yeah. now I feel like I'm pushing it. Now, you know, we're, we're on the show, so she's not going to say no to me, but I'm sure she's like, really? <laughs> right. But right. one more question. So what are your biggest hopes for people that you serve? You definitely have a servant leadership um, angle for sure. So when I say the people you serve, I mean, both the employee base, I mean, realtors, I mean, the community, what are your biggest hope for the people that you serve every day? Yeah, I mean, when I think about our membership, what I hope is that they understand the power of the work that they do. I mean, it is, it is integral to who we are as a community that they put people in homes. And especially at a time that homes have been at the center of our world when we were literally locked in them. I mean, you know, the, the power of that has evolved dramatically over the last several years. Um, and so I want them to take pride and ownership in the work that they do. When I think about the people that I work with, I want them to have the same level of pride and ownership in their ability to enable this group of professionals to do that. You know, these, these 20,000 plus realtors do what they do because my 55 people do what they do well. Um, and I think it's, it's an important relationship between us that we make this market go round and that we are, are, are literally holding up and building the Central Texas community. And I want them all to feel proud of that, to be aware of it and to own that. I love that. And I can just feel as always when talking to you, the real true authenticity of that answer. Um, as I've said to you many times, I think you are an extraordinary leader. Uh, it is fun to work alongside you in any capacity. I love how we've been able to convene some really important and courageous conversations. Um, and I th think you lead by example in a way that is um, life-giving and inspiring. And I am honored that you let me ask 
any questions on your podcast. So thank uh, you for that. Well, well, you know, Pam, I mean, we would have cut the bad ones. So let me just start there. But <laughs> I'm kidding. But um, I, I'm really appreciative of the relationship that you have with us and that, you know, the work that you've done with our organization and our team. It's been incredibly impactful. If there are even just a few small nuggets that people take from this podcast around the questions that they can be asking themselves and their in their businesses to continue to move this kind of work forward. Um, I'll know that we have, we've done our work and I'm just really appreciative of you as well. So thank, thank you. you. Thank you.